G'day folks. What I've done today is I've made what at least I believe to be the only super coach video you will need to see this preseason. So it should get you completely ready for the season ahead and also give you all the rookies you need and all the rookie structuring that you need as well. So um, I'll cover those components in absolute depth so that you will get your team completely right. Um, I don't profess to specialize in the premiums, but certainly in terms of the rookies in mid prices, that's where I shine. So I'm going to give you the right ones today. So let's get stuck in. So I've got here my defense, firstly. So what I'll do, I'll go through my team, I guess, as I go, but then I'll also go through, as I'm going through each line, the other rookies that I would consider if I was going to add another rookie in that line, who would be that sort of premier name. And I'll also go through some of the other players that I've given strong consideration to in each line to give some other players as well beyond just those that are included in my team. So going through one by one. So Ben Long. So really, I guess, seeing him in defense, really getting those kickouts and having that opportunity to generate significant drive he is currently in my team, and he was actually the very last player I picked just because he was at a convenient price point. So by no means am I saying go out and get him. He is not someone you have to have. But frankly, I don't like any of the expensive defenders this year. So um, that really helps his case, and I don't like um, Gold Coast defense. So I think that actually gives him an opportunity to, um, I guess, gain a spot and hold his spot for the season potentially. So... Um, Long as someone you can consider, but certainly the player I'm least convinced convinced of in my team. I don't think he quite has that thirty point upside, but he might have twenty to twenty five percent upside perhaps from his starting price. So I can look at that as a reasonable enough stepping stone. Um, Elliot Yo, um, if he's going to be playing midfield and at this price in defence, which is a tricky position to fill to a good standard, I'm really happy to bring him in. And Hunter Clark looks like he's going to be a midfielder. Um, based on his preseason games. So, um, yeah, I'm optimistic that he's got some real upside for price growth too. Um, Jack Bowes, really cheap, like him. Doesn't matter where he plays. He's got the upside to go up by sort of your equivalent of 30 points. So I think there's going to be substantial price rises, assuming at least that he holds his position as part of Geelong's best 22. So whether he's a mid or defender, I do not mind at all. I think there's real upside there. Um, Jinbi, very, uh, what I'm finding is over the preseason, big improver, but seeing him through the midfield and be that, I guess, major ball winner through there, he'll lay his tackles as well. Um, I, I think he's going to have a decent season and is worth fielding. So he's one that I'd be saying to you now, get on your field. You need to, at the absolute minimum, be fielding Jinbi in your defense. So... Um, the other name that I'm looking to field, and I'm actually quite surprised um, that I've got him in my team, um, but yeah, Constable's actually made his way into my team for a very specific reason. So um, with the Suns, look, there is, I guess, the job security query of when um, their other defenders return, what is to happen with Constable. But it feels like, at least in the short to medium term, he's in, and He's actually someone where he's got the capability of playing across halfback and generating drive. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him hold his spot. And at least while he's playing, I think he's going to score very well. So um, if you want some really quick scoring projections, well, they could both score 75 each. So um, I think that's pretty good. And for me, that's field worthy. And then you've got my bench. So you've got Connor McKenna. Um, you have to note that he's never scored above, I think, roughly 80 top of mind. And on Brisbane, you've got a number of really good rebounding defenders. So I'm expecting McKenna to be um, best 22 for Brisbane, um, but I'm not expecting, say, 75s as I would be here. So therefore, I quite like McKenna as a bench option, but um, yeah, he might average, I'll make up a number and say 65 to 70. So um, given that, Given his price point, I think that would be a very good return. But there is some sub-risk, so um, another thing to be mindful of. So, yeah, with the defense rookies, they're not incredible, but there's a number of them who are nonetheless viable, is how I would term that. 
Um, you've got Darcy Wilmot. I think he's going to be best 22 for Brisbane, and I think he's a very safe bench option. So he's someone who should be on your bench. McKenna isn't a necessity, um, but I do think he'll score a little better than Wilmot and as a result make similar, if not a little better money. Um, as for others, I considered in defence. So if I was to go with a more expensive defender, Nick Dacos is the one I would go with. But the condition of actually selecting him would be that he's selected as a midfielder. Across half back, my personal opinion last year is that Dacos was Collingwood's most influential. And really that piece that really, I guess, generated the most meaningful drive from defence. So if Dacos is along half back, well, um, yeah, he's going to be copying a tag very often. And it's hard to see him scoring anywhere close to that sort of 110 or top six scoring defender. Um, range. So therefore, not in my team at this stage, but um, yeah, look, if he sort of permanently shifts to the midfield at some point, well, I'll obviously be reconsidering my position there with Dacos. Um, as for the other rookies, so if I was to choose to have another defense rookie, which um, I have given strong consideration to, um, Alex Sincotta from Carlton. So he's a minimum priced mature age defender. Um, had a very, very strong season in the VFL for Carlton. So um, he's someone who would be in my preferred best 22 for Carlton. But there is some talk that um, maybe Lockie Cowan might play ahead of him, who um, another first year um, defender for Carlton. So he's a Tasmanian who can also in his own right generate drives. So he's another you could consider. Um, others on my short list that I've considered. Um, Josh Gota, if I was looking for another field option, I would probably be leaning towards a Gota in defense. So, um, yeah, so that would be probably the way I'd be going there. Um, others, if I was looking for field options that are in that sort of super cheap range, Liam Soccer, I think, is going to make money and Liam Jones will make money. Um, but I don't think Jones will necessarily make as much money as um, the other, I guess, cheapies that I'm looking at. So... Um, do be mindful of that. Um, Campbell Chesser um, seems to have his fan club. Uh, I, I'm expecting him to play wing, halfback, or some combination of the two. But yeah, very outside, not huge production. Um, so I, I personally have him slightly behind those others. But look, if you need that sort of DPP link, you could consider him for a bench place. But yeah, structurally, basically what I would be saying is if I wanted another field option, probably Gota, and hypothetically, let's say um, I needed another bench option, let's say a McKenna or Wilmont weren't playing, I'd probably bring in a Sin Cotter, if, assuming he's named round one. So that's for a quick and dirty feel, but in the rough order I've listed them is roughly in preference. So um, yeah, hopefully that helps out with um, your rookies in defense. Um, and then also for a few names to look out for during the season. I'm sure this is something that um, a lot of super coach people out there will be looking for. So um, you've got Corey Wagner, who um, Fremantle, so he's obviously done his round with a few AFL teams. Had a good season in the VFL, looks really good across halfback. Um, injured currently, but I wouldn't be surprised if he established himself as best 22 for Fremantle. So be very aware of his name. Um, he's someone I'd be comfortable fielding, honestly. So... Um, yeah, when he comes in, um, make him a priority. If he plays his two games for super coach purposes, um, yeah, bring him in for that third game would be my strong suggestion. Um, so he could be a good downgrade target. Um, once healthy, two others I like the look of, um, Nick Caulfield, very underpriced. He's played well before. I think he's got the scope to be a best 22 player again for the Saints, but let him play his two games, see how he's going. If it looks like he's going to hold his spot, um, he's going to make you money if he's going to be staying. So um, note that name down in your notebooks. And I'd also say similar of um, Caleb Marchbank for Carlton. So really good interceptor. He can score reasonably enough, as I'd say, of a Caulfield, but he's going to make you money ultimately given the starting price point. So if I was to compare, say, the likes of Caulfield and Marchbank to, say, a Liam Jones or Liam Stocker, I think they're going to score more. But it's just a case of... I guess we'll need to wait for them to be healthy and we need to make sure they're best 22. Marchbank will be best 22 for Carlton, I'm assuming is, in my mind at least, best 22. And then with a Caulfield, there seems to be a little more doubt. But um, look, for me personally, if I was putting together a best 22 for the Saints, I do like Caulfield and think on talent, there shouldn't be anyone keeping him out. But 
Um, the Saints do have quite a number of options, that's no certainty. And the other one as well I would say to look out for, and I don't think are we necessarily named round one, but um, Aaron Francis. So he's transferred from Essendon. Um, so yeah, he's definitely one that um, yeah could be considered. I think he's got a chance to establish himself as best 22 for Sydney. And if not, then I think he's in the mix for a stretch of games. So um, for me, his best position is in defense. So I'd be really looking at him as sort of that intercept marking defender who can also generate drive with his kick in particular, a bit of a weapon. So um, yeah, that's definitely a name I would be saying also to note down for when he plays. And again, if he plays his two games, looks like he'll hold his spot. Um, really good defense option that I particularly like this year. Okay, so to move into the midfield. So I've got Bont as my M1, Kelly as my M2. Um, Bont and Pally, look, with um, Dunkley going, my assumption is that he will play more midfield minutes and therefore his average should improve. So one thing I've learned from um, working with Selby for a couple of years there um, with his season guide, um, do get behind it if you haven't already, is that you really want to look for players with upside for growth. And even though Bont and Pally is a... Um, premium or uber premium, depending on how you want to consider it. Um, I do think there's that little bit of upside for growth with those additional midfield minutes. And he's durable, so those factors help. So I quite like having him in my team. Um, Josh Kelly, I think there's substantial upside for growth. Durability is an issue, admittedly. And that is the one reason that he isn't necessarily a lock for my team. But um, I do think with um, Taranto and Hopper gone, it will mean an expanded midfield um, role and responsibility for Kelly, and therefore I think he'll be um, one to boost his scoring. So I think I'm betting on him being a top eight scoring midfielder this year, ultimately. So um, again, there's the upside for um, growth there based on his starting price point, which is very depressed um, considering his talent and capabilities for big scores, in my opinion. Um, Tom Green... I think he's going to be one of the top scoring players this year, if not the top scoring super coach player this year. Um, so maybe it sounds like a sensational call, but um, yeah, I think he'll be the first possession winner at stoppages for the Giants and he'll just be dishing out at will to the likes of your Callahan's, your Callies. Callie will be winning his own footy as well. But um, yeah, Green will be really that um, yeah primary ball winner who wins a really, really high volume in there. So watch out for that. I think he's going to have a big year and I think he's going to be a top eight scoring mid at the very least. That could be wrong, but I'm I'm backing in my bloke. Uh, very underpriced, if nothing else. Very, very underpriced. Um, Jacob Hopper, why is he there? He's there to make money at the end of the day. He's proved that he can score before. He's had a 300 contested possession season. So when you've got guys that are in that sort of class at this price point, um, going to a situation where there's expanded midfield opportunities after, um, yeah, what's how he's sort of been. Um, yeah, look, I think he's really going to make a substantial amount of price growth. So 30-plus point scoring upside, um, I think he goes for maybe it's 90 to 100 would be roughly what I'd be expecting of a hopper this year. So I think a good season ahead looms. Um, James Warple, he's proven that he can play before. And I'm suggesting that um, with the likes of um, Tom Mitchell gone, um, you've got um, O'Meara gone as well. I think that's going to mean much greater um, midfield responsibility for a Warple. So um, therefore, I'm expecting him to return to um, his previous high scoring days. So um, I think he can pretty easily do a 90. I don't think that'll be um, beyond him at all. I think he's going to make a lot of money. Um, Finn Callahan, it looks like he's ready for an expanded midfield role and um, he's really needed for that midfield balance as well for the Giants. So it looks like he's set for that breakout year. And look, it's not necessarily that he'll be winning the ball himself. I think he'll be fed a lot of the footy, but at this price point, he'll be finding a lot of it too. If you saw his preseason match and how he scored there, um, that shows the scoring upside that he potentially has. Not suggesting he'll necessarily average that, but... Um, Who's to say he can't average 80 to 85? I think that's um, within the realms of possibility for a Finn Callahan. So um, if you're after someone in this rough price point to make you money, he's one you can consider. But onto the rookies. And these two are must-haves, and I would say must-haves on the field, to be very clear. 
So Will Ashcroft, who's to say he can't score 90 to 100? He's that good. He's as good as Nick Dacos year one sort of thing. That's my expectation. Um, with an Ashcroft, look, if he was to be a third option perhaps at center bounces, where if he was to play the third, attend the third most center bounces overall, he could crack 100 plus potentially. He's got that level of scoring within him. So um, he does need the CBAs, but look, you have to have him on your field. Otherwise, you're losing um, out on a lot of points because he's going to be putting up big numbers this year. So um, watch out for Will Ashcroft. He's the most advanced pure midfielder that I've seen. So in terms of year one impact, expect Judd, but more production. And I'm very serious in making that comparison as well. So um, Because he's got that same first possession winning, but he's also got that burst from the contest. And he does it time after time. It's just the sheer frequency he does it. I've never seen that frequency of just winning first possession on the move and just driving out of the contest as I've seen with Ashcroft. He's an absolute weapon through there, and that's why I've been calling Brisbane for the flag this year because, um, yeah, he's one of the real factors that will influence that very heavily. Um, with a Cam McKenzie, um, look, I think he's going to be played pretty prominently through that Hawthorne midfield. Hawthorne are really going in the youth direction and yeah, it looks like he's ready for big minutes through there. And um, if preseason is to give any indication, well, he's going to score big. And funnily enough, teammates with Ashcroft and they were really the ultimate one-two punch last year. So um, it's cool for those that watched a lot of them to really see them in this conversation. But yeah, I'm expecting big numbers from a McKenzie just because I think the CBAs will be there for him. So um, again, I think he's going to average... Probably 75, I think, would be a realistic number. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking as that, I guess, pass mark for field options this year to be about that 75 range. And I, I think McKenzie can do that. So, yeah, watch out for him. Um, Jack Bytel, look, if he's best 22 for the Saints, and I, I can't assure you of that, but look, if he's named, I think he's going to be scoring for you. So um, that's why he's in my team. And if I wanted to go heavier on rookies, I would be quite comfortable having a buy tell on the field. So what's his game look like? Well, strong contested ball winner, strong tackler, otherwise pretty vanilla. So that's the real sort of quick understanding of how he plays. But um, he, he'll, he, it's quite possible that he's in there as a tagger. So um, you can't expect huge, huge numbers, but he will be seeing midfield minutes if he's playing. He's, he's really a pure mid. So um, yeah, one I'd be very comfortable and very happy to have not only in my team, but even on the field if I had to have another rookie mid. So um, a name to have in your team if confident on his best 22 chances. Um, St Kilda do have a very vanilla midfield, and look, Bytel is another of those, I suppose, to put it that way. Um, but yeah, look, on quality of play, he's one who at least should be in the mix, and it sounds like he's a good chance actually for round one is my understanding. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But yeah, if he's named round one, I'll at least be starting with him if that makes you feel better. Um, Will Phillips, um, he's had sort of injury interrupted years until now. But um, yeah, look, not necessarily one I'm going to start on my field. Look, if you needed, say, beyond Ashcroft and Mackenzie, two other midfielders to start on your field, you could probably get away with having Phillips there. But um, I do think there's the chance that he'll have some lower scores just because the midfield minutes aren't guaranteed to be there for him just because there's actually quite a few good midfielders for North Melbourne. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But I think he'll average a little below a Bytel. So Bytel could go for, I'll make up a number and say 70 to 75. And with a Phillips, maybe it's more like that, maybe 65, maybe 70 could be roughly what he averages. So... Um, yeah, just to give you a quick feel there. Um, Oscar Baker, I've, there were others that I could consider as alternatives and I don't think Baker's going to score huge. So he's not a necessity. He's very outside, doesn't rack up the footy all that much, but I think the job security could well be there. Um, just because the dogs don't really have much in the way of good outside mids. So, um, he could be one to potentially hold his spot and it's a good price point. So, He's one to consider, at least, and I've really got him there more so from a job security perspective. But to go through the other mids I considered, so Rory Laird was a strong consideration just as a pure captain option. Um, if I had more money, maybe I'd consider it. 
Um, but yeah, there's not the scoring upside, which is the problem there. He's really sort of priced to perfection, in my opinion, at least. Um, Jack McRae, for me, he's underpriced. Um, and with Dunkley going, well, I would assume there's some scoring upside for a Jack McRae. So um, yeah, if I had room for another premium mid, um, he would be one that I would be very strongly considering. Jack Steele, his price is a bit compressed um, from where it was um, a year ago. So he's one where certainly as a sort of previous high scoring mid um, could be considered potentially. Um, and the other one that I considered, and this is probably a bit out of left field, but I also considered Will Setterfield briefly, but um, just a touch pricier than I'd like. If he was priced maybe below a Warple, that would be more tempting. But yeah, it's just if he was 50k cheaper, he'd be one where it would be almost hard to leave him out. I think he's going to have a good year for Essendon. And I think he's going to figure out enough um, stoppages to um, score quite well. Um, other rookies I considered in the midfield. Um, so Oliver Hollands, I think, is one with good job security, but he's priced a little bit higher than I would like for a bench rookie. Um, and there's others that might score a little bit more as well. So um, to compare him to a Baker, I think his job security is about the same, if not a touch better than Baker. I think Hollands is the best 22 player for Carlton. I'll speculate um, this year. But yeah, he's, very, he's probably going to be more outside. So it's really that endurance specialist. He can win his own ball, but um, for Carlton's purposes, he'll play on a wing. Um, the other rookie that I gave consideration to, and if named round one, and on the condition it sounds like he's got the job security to hold his spot, I would be considering, instead of Baker, I would be considering Matt Roberts, so um, Sydney midfielder. So he's got the versatility to play forward. You could play him back. Um, he could play on a wing, inside mid. He's really quite versatile. But elite endurance runner, um, can win his own footy, racks it up at will, has a booming kick on him. So... Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he can gain a spot in Sydney's best side and then hold his spot. Um, he's certainly one with that scoring upside. So let's say he comes in a bit later in the year, gets a couple of games, looks pretty good. Well, bring him into your team as a um, downgrade target then. I really like the look of him. So yeah, if I was to say need another rookie mid, I'd probably go Roberts in as another bench option. And then that would probably mean Bytel has to come to the field. So um, that's for a rough feel. But yeah, my rookie structure, I feel, is pretty well optimized. Um, the only slight optimization that if you wanted to fit another rookie onto the field, I would be saying probably Sheezel would be the first one I'd bring onto the field, which would mean you'd need another bench rookie here. So I'll go into that in a little bit um, as to some of those thoughts around that. But I'll next move on to Ruck. So in the Ruck, so... You've got English, who I'm not super-duper confident on, but for me it felt like the least bad of the alternatives. So we'll have to see with sort of, I guess, some injury question marks around him. That isn't ideal and sort of what makes me sort of think about some other options potentially. But um, if all goes well, then he's probably the second-highest scoring um, Ruckman this year is my thinking. So... Look, at this stage, he's in there for now. But yeah, not convinced. So feel free to consider other ruck options. Um, Marshall, I think, will be the highest scoring ruckman this year. Um, without Ryder, having greater ruck minutes, I think will be absolutely huge for him. So yeah, I really like Marshall this year, it's fair to say, as a ruck option. I think he'll score a lot just because he wins so much of his own footy through there. Um, Asava Radigalia, um, I, I believe it's actually pronounced Radigalia, I think I heard him say in an interview, so um, commentators might have to update um, their pronunciation. But um, yeah, I think he's probably the more likely um, bench option to play, is my thinking at this stage. So in terms of to play round one, to hold his spot, I think he's going to be best 22 for Geelong in defence, whereas the other um, ruck bench options probably don't hold their spot, is my thinking at this stage. So given that, even though if it was an actual ruckman playing, I think they would be scoring more, um, and therefore if they were going to hold their spot, they would be um, more preferable options. But 
Um, yeah, look, given I'm not op- optimistic about that job security element with the others, um, Radagolia, I think, is probably um, going to be my bench option through the ruck. Other rucks I considered, um, Darcy Cameron, um, based, because at the start of the season he was sharing, or he was behind um, Brody Grundy, um, basically his scoring, there is still a little bit of upside there, but a bit like within English, there are those um, injury concerns. But look, with the DPP, it's helpful, but um, given my forward structuring, as you can see, there's probably not that sort of critical need for a DPP given my front half is so strong. So um, given that a Cameron isn't sort of a necessity for the purposes of my team. Um, Sean Darcy, I gave consideration to, but with reduced ruck minutes, and I guess um, Luke Jackson wanting some ruck minutes himself and needing it really to be fully effective, well, um, I do think that takes away some of the scoring upside there because with a Darcy, well, he's got the highest scoring ceiling of all the rucks if he's to sort of carry the ruck responsibility on his own. But in sharing it, I do think that'll take away from the scoring upside. So um, with that, with some durability sort of history issues, look, he's probably not my guy. Max Gorn, I've considered, but I think Grundy's going to take most of the ruck minutes. I think what we'll find is that although Grundy kicked a few goals in the preseason game, I do think that um, Grundy will have to um, play pretty much 70% ruck and then Gorn will just be left with that sort of last 30%, just because I don't believe in Grundy as a forward. Really good ruckman, but um, really in terms of goal kicking capabilities, he's kicked more of his goals on the run from 50 than he has when he's been. Um, used as a forward so um, just too many components missing there so um, look hopefully he can develop that forward craft but he hasn't shown it to date so therefore I'm not going to make that assumption with Grundy I don't think it's a perfect combination by any stretch of the imagination Um, Oscar McInerney I've given consideration to but um, yeah look if Darcy Fort is playing for um, Brisbane that's a no he's not relevant under that circumstance it really needs to be he needs to be the solo ruck and then you'd need someone like whether it's a Danaher or whoever else sort of relieving him would be more if McInerney is playing as heavy ruck minutes that's when he's relevant um, the other rookies so you've got um, Lachlan McAndrew who may be a best 22 chance but once Hickey is back healthy I think he's probably behind Hickey and Laddams to be realistic so um, that sort of makes it a bit hard for uh, McAndrew to um, be the best 22. Um, I've also given consideration to Brees Teekle, but, um, oh, sorry, Bryn Teekle, but look, with um, Port Adelaide, I think they're probably going to go Lysette ahead of him. And then if that's not working, well, also they've got Finn Lason, who they could consider as well, um, who they played through the ruck a bit last year. So, um, yeah, not sure about either of their best 22 chances, honestly. But two names that I'll bring up that you may or may not hear elsewhere. And these two would only get games in the case of injury. So Liam Reedy for Fremantle. So he was taken as a mature ager. Um, If there is an injury to either Darcy or possibly Jackson, then he would be the Ruckman to come in. So um, particularly if it's Darcy because, um, yeah, Reedy is a good ruck. He can also play a little bit forward as well, so that gives him a chance if, say, Jackson is out, maybe he can play a little bit forward. But, yeah, look for Reedy as a possible sort of, I guess, recent mature ager who might, at a rookie price point, um, be a possible piece. So if one of those rucks for Frio goes down for a long period, you could see Reedy come in and be good. Um, Ned Moyle is the other name I want to bring up. So if... Um, for Gold Coast, if uh, Jared Witz goes out for the season, hope that doesn't happen, of course. Witz is a superstar. But if he did go down for the season for whatever reason, I think Ned Moyle would be the ruckman to come in for the Suns. And I, th- from watching him in the VFL, I can tell he's a very, very good ruckman. He's pretty well ready, even based off last year's play, to really come in and be a number one ruck for a team. So, um, but... Playing in the same team with Wits, I don't think is realistic. So at Collingwood, when Wits was there, um, Grundy and Wits couldn't both really coexist in the same team. They're both pure rucks. And I'd say the same of Moyle. He's a ruckman, not a forward. So um, he can't work in combination with Wits, who also is really a ruck and not a forward. So, um, so yeah, I guess keep an eye out for Ned Moyle if ever that was to 
occur and Wits is going to miss an extended period. Moyer would be the bloke to look out for there as a really good rookie get. Um, On to the forwards. So um, I've gone with a potentially dubious strategy, but I just can't resist the value with any of these players. I think they've all got upside at their high-ish price points. So that's why they're in here. So you've got a Dunkley who he could be the highest sort of, I guess, average per game scorer in Supercoach this year. I think that's a genuine possibility. There are the durability concerns, but um, put him on a Brisbane where, look, he's either a number one or number two midfielder next to Neil. I I think that's going to mean more ball for him and more ball one sort of contested than was the case at the Dogs where he had the likes of Bont, he had McRae, he had Libba. He had all these really, I guess, prolific ball winners in that same midfield. So um, with a Brisbane, I think that, I guess, responsibility will be slightly elevated. Now Brisbane, I think, have clearly the best midfield in the comp now that they've got Dunkley. But um, yeah, I think he's going to score really big this year. So um, yeah, can't resist having him in my team. Cornelio, why is he there? Well, the very start of last year, he wasn't really playing midfield. So um, you've got a few games where he had those depressed CBA numbers. Um, but then now that you've got Taranto and Hopper gone, well, who's to say Canelio doesn't see a few more CBAs per game? And if that's to be the case, well, there's some scoring upside here. And when you've got a score, when you've got some scoring upside from someone who you believe will be a top six scorer by position, well, there's no reason they shouldn't be in your team, basically. Connor Rosie, now that he's a um, looking like a full-time mid this year, well, they're scoring upside there because he wasn't a full-time mid all of last year. So, um, And seeing some of the big numbers he was putting up as a mid um, last year and seeing how he's looking through the preseason, well, um, yeah, he looks like he's going to be a top six mid as well. And again, with scoring upside. Taranto coming in at a depressed price and um, with increased responsibility on what really has been a bad Richmond midfield. Um, yeah, I think he's going to be increasing his average this year. And again, I think he's a top six midfielder. Um, Errol Goulden, this is one <clears throat> I believe to be quite a bit more speculative, I have to concede. Obviously, the big preseason game is what all the talk is about. But I guess the thing that will need to be watched is whether he continues to get a lot of CBAs. Because last year he wasn't getting a lot. So if he's now going to be a regular um, on baller for Sydney, well, there's the scoring upside for him to be not only a top six scoring forward, but he could be a top two to three scoring forward potentially. So, um, yeah, so it's really, I guess, hard to know. I haven't followed closely enough what the story is there and as to Sydney's plans with Golden, but if he is going to be predominantly used as an inside mid I think he has to be in my team so um, that's my thinking there and with a Ben Cunnington well he's North Melbourne's very best midfielder so I can't see them taking him out of center bounces I think he'll be predominantly a center bounce midfielder even if he does have some stretches forward or at least some rest minutes forward Um, but yeah in terms of his sheer inside stuff winning that much contested um I think he's probably going to go for 100 this year. And look, he may or may not be a top six scoring forward, but if he's not, he'll be very close and he'll make a fair bit of money. So given that, um, yeah, I'm pretty keen on Cunnington this year. Um, Sheasel, as I said, you could have him on your field and I reckon you could possibly get away with that on the condition that he is to play either some midfield or some defense. If he's just going to be camped as a pure forward and used deep forward, well, he's going to struggle to score enough. But yeah, he has the scope to be a 70 to 75 type forward if he does get um, some minutes up the field somewhere else as well as forward. So um, yeah, I like Sheasel this year and I slightly prefer him actually to a Toby McLean at that price point. So with a McLean look, he just hasn't looked great during the preseason, which is the issue there. Um And then you've got Green. So um, with Gunston gone, I think Green will roughly be a new Gunston for the Hawks, where he's not quite a key forward. He's more that sort of third tall, but he's a genuine avenue to goal. And I think he's going to not only be best 22, but hold his spot and be a really important option inside 50. So 
Um, I think with Green, he's good for a bench spot. As for other forwards I considered, and I really like a lot of the forwards this year, and it was really hard to leave a lot out. Um, the two players I really regret leaving out were Sam Flanders and Tanner Bruin. Um, if there was a way to fit either of them in, I would really like to be able to, but um, I just couldn't with basically the forwards that I have in. I'm just sort of that keen to include them all that, yeah, I just couldn't. But with a Flanders and Bruin, they've bo both got roughly sort of 30-point upsides for scoring. So, um, yeah, if they're at a price point that they fit your structure, um, give them consideration. It looks like Bruin will be a um, mid for... Um, Geelong and then with the Flanders well even though it looks like he'll be mostly a forward for the Suns well knowing how great he was sort of in the VFL at the back end of the year having two finals games with 40 plus touches um, he did get a few CBAs in his most recent um, match but um, yeah I think he'll be pretty effective and score quite a bit even if he is mostly as a forward so um, they're two names that um, I guess for your consideration Jack Zebel, there's definite scoring upside. If he's moving to defense and taking kickouts, well, he's going to improve his average. Um, but I have him slightly behind the likes of Flanders and Bruin at this stage. Um, Horn Francis, I really like this year as well. I think he's going to take another step up with his footy this year and be a lot more comfortable at Port Adelaide. Probably he's going to play some forward as well as mid, but I think he's just going to have a better season. And there's definite scoring upside. But for me, I, I would prefer Flanders, Bruin, and um, Zeeble if given the choice, personally. Um, as for other, other rookie options, and there are quite a few rookie options in the front half, so you don't have to go as sort of thin as I have in terms of rookies. Um, if I was to have one more, I would probably go McLean on bench, um, Sheasel on field, assuming, of course, that um, McLean is chosen in round one. That would be the condition there. Um, if, say, a McLean wasn't chosen in round one, I would probably go um, Filippo on my bench. And the funny thing is, um, it seems like um, Filippo has very high ownership this year, and it looks like he's going to play round one and probably hold his spot. But, um, and, and look, I'm actually probably his biggest advocate in the country, at least in last year's draft. I had him number two in my power rankings, and there was even a point in the year where I was actually thinking look, maybe he's got the upside to be better than Ashcroft. So um, I'm that high on Filippo. I think he'll be a monster long term. But to give you some perspective that no one else in the Supercoach or AFL fantasy community can provide you. So with a Filippo, this is the thing you need to note. He's got a December birthday. And based on that, well, really he's only maybe even a few days older than a few players that you're going to get drafted next year. So look, even though he's likely to be playing a lot, if not all the games possibly this year, he's not likely going to be dominating this year. I think it'll really take him two to three years to not only find his feet, I think he'll have his moments and he'll establish himself as that best 22 player, but to really become the superstar that I envisage him becoming in the future, so think of it, him as potentially your Bont 2.0, I think it will still take a few years for him to get there To until we're sort of talking about him as a star. So... Um, do be mindful of that. So, look, I don't think he'll be scoring super duper high. He could, based on, like, what, what I'm expecting with a Filippo is that he's going to be required to play forward. So that's going to impede quite substantially on his scoring. He can play forward and um, kick goals for you and he can take a grab. But for the purposes of fantasy football, be it Supercoach, be it AFL fantasy, you really want him as a forward. That's the... Um, big important thing to note. Um, so yeah, look, you you want him as a mid, so yeah, he's not going to score a lot. It, it, for a quick projection for a Filippo, he might average. A, if he's going to play purely forward, I'd say probably he averages fifty. So that's not really enough at his price point. If he gets some midfield minutes, maybe he's more that sort of fifty to sixty this year for super coach purposes. So again, I think there's probably a few better options, but. Um, just because this year there are actually a lot of good um, rookies that I think will score quite well. So um, they're the things to be aware of with um, Filippo. It's not a trap by any means, but um, I just think there's probably better options. But look, if you needed, for whatever reason, the um, extra rookies, well, you could easily just go 
um, Sheasel, then you could go McLean, and then if you wanted, you could just go like a Filippo and then Green on your bench, and you could probably get away with that. That's if you wanted to structure that way, but um, there's just so much mid-price value that I can't sort of justify having that many rookies in my team this year, as well as I think a lot of the rookies are going to go and score this year. Um, other rookies that I'm looking at, you've got um, Oscar Allen. So um, he's not a rookie, but like he's a rookie priced. So with an Allen though, the thing that I'm thinking about is, well, he's probably not going to get the ruck minutes. He'll just be expected to be a pure forward. And he hasn't, as a pure forward, really scored that much before. And with West Coast midfield terrible, he's not going to get the delivery. So I think his upside and potential scoring is going to be pretty capped. So um, yeah, I don't think he'll sort of make you as much money as some of the cheaper options. And given those field spots in the front half are so valuable, as you can see with um, my selections, look, there's other, others I'd take ahead of him. Um, Josh Bruce, you could definitely consider if he looks like he's going to be best 22 for the dogs. Um, but I do think those others will score a little bit more than him, quite likely. So um, be mindful of that. Um, you could consider him instead of maybe a Filippo, but um, I do think his job security may be slightly less. Um, so we'll have to see how that sort of plays out and how things fit. But the dogs just have so many um, good key position players that they can't sort of just play them all. Um, Alwyn Davy Jr. It looks like his ownership is quite high. Um, the thing I'd say with him is, and he can actually play both um, mid and forwards. That's something you should probably be aware of. So he's not just a crumbing forward who applies pressure like his dad. He can actually genuinely go up the field play on a wing. You could even put him in a center bounce if you wanted, but um, he's not necessarily, doesn't have that contested side. And look, he can be prone to having quiet games where he feels invisible. So um, yeah, look, in terms of scoring scope, I do think it's quite a bit less than the others. Um, what could he average? He could average probably 45, maybe 50 would be what I'd be thinking. And he'd be one of the sub risks. So um, personally, I wouldn't say his best 22 for Essendon this year, though, um, look, it's possible that they do play him and do find a spot for him, given there is that, I guess, weakness and relative need for someone who can sort of crumb and do a few things for Essendon up forward. So we'll have to see, um, whether he does fit in, but if he does, look, there's other options I slightly prefer, but look, if you've got him, you won't be burned, but he's a bench option if you do. Um, Sam Sturt, another who I think will be... Possibly in the mix for games, we'll have to see how regularly. Fremantle do have those front half weaknesses, so that's something to be aware of. So there is that potential opportunity, and he was sort of a former early pick who just hasn't been able to establish himself. So, yeah, look out, look out for the name and um, be aware that um, maybe he can push in and play. But, um, yeah, he'd be only a bench option if you brought him in, if he was to be named. Um, Luke Pedlar, he's got a chance to be best 22. Um, whether he holds his spot, that's unclear. Um, but for me, he'd be ideal if he was cheaper. I think he's probably a bit pricey for what he's likely to offer relatively. Um, so, yeah, there's other options around that price point I slightly prefer. Um, ben King, very cheap, admittedly. Um, but, yeah, doesn't really fit my structure. And he doesn't have that scoring history either. So coming off a major injury... Um, I, I can't see him necessarily breaking his previous scoring records. So there should be others that make more money. Orazio Fantasia, look, he needs to get healthy um, and stay healthy. They're sort of the big issues there. Um, scoring upside isn't huge, but yeah, look, reasonably priced for what he offers. But there's, again, probably around that same price point, slightly better options that are at the very least more durable. Um, a name to look out for, and it doesn't sound like he's going to be playing round one, but um, Joe Richards is a name that um, I'll say to look out for. So a Collingwood listed forward. So um, the opportunity that I'm looking for is this. So what Richards brings to the table is run and carry. That's what he does well. So what I'd be looking for with Collingwood is for if Nick, De if Nick Dacos transitions to become a midfielder, then I'd be looking for them to bring in someone like a Joe Richards as essentially a replacement across halfback for a Nick Dacos. Um, under that circumstance, I can see the Dacos move to the midfield working. And if Richards is across, is across halfback, you would assume that um, if he's someone where he can generate meaningful run and drive, he'd find a bit of the footy. Of course, he's someone where he, was, he wasn't drafted from the VFL or a major competition. He was just sort of picked locally. 
Um, so um, there aren't sort of those, or at least I don't have any stats on him. So, but look, given sort of the style of game he can play, if he's playing in defense, he should score reasonably. If he's as a forward, well, he won't score a heap. So that's the thing to be aware of. Uh, he has played a lot of his footy as a forward and he's named as a forward for a reason. He's also played some mid as well locally. But um, but yeah, it's certainly have him on your radar as a name to bring in if he plays his two games. That's what I'd be saying of a Joe Richards there. So again, if I was to recommend a structure, I would say basically go with my rookie structure. So all the players that are Ashcroft price or lower, I would be saying bring in, put in the spots that I have them in, and then basically fill out the rest of the team. If from a price points perspective, you decide I don't want this many mid prices, this is far too risky for me, don't like it, this is what I would suggest. I would be moving Sheasel to the field and I would be bringing in Toby McLean as the bench option there. So that way with Sheasel up forward, you've got basically another pretty capable scorer on the field, you're going to make a heap of money and then you're going to have another rookie that's going to make you money. And that's the way where if you want more premiums in your structure, that's the way to do it and what I'd be recommending for this year. So probably for the purposes of most teams, that will probably be the most optimal structure is what I'm thinking. Because, um, yeah, ultimately with these bench options, you're probably going to be getting sort of your 70s or less. Whereas with a Sheasel, I think he's probably more your 70 to 75. But just for the purposes of my team, I couldn't fit him on my field. So um, there is always that flexibility in terms of structuring. But um, yeah, for those that want to build your rookie structure and then build the rest of the team around that rookie structure, well, yeah, that's my advice to you for those that are looking to do that. And um, I've also, I guess, brought in those contingencies as to, well, if particular players aren't named, well, in this video I've gone through, well, who are those other viable rookie options at their price points? So... Um, yeah, look, if there's other players you want to know more about, whether it's any of the rookies, um, any of the other players at whatever price point, anything about structuring or what have you, ask away. Again, I've got a working knowledge of every player on every list. Um, so yeah, ask, ask, feel free to ask away. But yeah, it's just, I guess, from what I've learned from Selby, his advice is always, yeah, build around your rookies, make sure you get your rookie structure right first. And then the rest of the team can just sort of build around that. So um, if that's coming from a two-time winner of AFL Fantasy and he played Supercoach last year for the first time and um, finished actually very high for a first time of playing Supercoach, he was almost a contender for the overall prize. Um, yeah, I think it's probably the reason really why you should be watching this video to really get the best advice on rookies because you won't sort of get anyone, anyone talking Supercoach who knows more about really all the rookies, all the cheapies, all the mid prices anywhere. So um, yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed and yeah, any questions hit me up in the comment section below. And um, yeah, if you haven't already, of course, subscribe, hit the notification bell for future updates and yeah, give this video a like and also share it with your friends. Um, this is the one super coach video and I'll say it again, I, I believe to be really the one essential super coach watch for season 2023. But yeah, anyway, folks, see you in the next video.